drink yet. That could be. It's Captain Dave, the floor is yours. Oh, wow. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Walter said that, uh, he said to me that his house is haunted. I asked him, how do you know? He said, my wife's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here ever not caught a snook? Thank God. <laughs> all right, everybody's got snook here. Cool. All right, so we all know about, you know, a little bit about how stubborn they can be. Lazy, lethargic, opportunistic. I've been addicted to snook fishing since I was 10 years old. I caught my first snook in Midnight Pass. I was standing on a dock at Harrow Lagoon in Sarasota down Midnight Pass Road. We were, my, my stepfather, my mother, and my, my brother and I, <coughs> We were living in a little house there in the lagoon. And I was out there with my little junkie pole, my little Zepco 404 thing with a push button. And I had a big diamond sinker and the pink beads and the steel leader, you know, the real Yankee rig, squitter rig we called them, with a chunk of dead stinky squid and I'm flipping it out there and I'm catching a catfish here and there and just junk. I'm really not catching anything. And my next door neighbor walks over. I barely knew him. And he walks over and goes, hi Dave, what are you doing? I go, I'm fishing. He goes, yes you are. <laughs> Well, little did I know that his name is Earl Downey. He wrote the book, How to Fish for Snook. And he walks over and he picks up my pole and he goes, Psh, he breaks it over his leg and he throws the trash can out back. And I'm like, <laughs> he goes, come here. And we went to his garage and he handed me a brand new Mitchell 300 in the box and a brand new Shakespeare rod and spooled it up and put new line on it. And showed me how to tie knots and put a wild willy jig on it. And he says, go ask your mother if I can take you fishing tonight. Okay. So... She said, Mom's like, yeah, sure. So we went and he took me out back by the, again, by the lagoon. We practiced casting that wild willy jig with a spinner. I never threw a spinner in my life. It wasn't good for about the first two hours. <laughs> I mean, I hooked every, I hit everything with the water. But finally got me down and I was pretty good. And he took me down to Midnight Pass when it was open in Sarasota that night. And I was throwing a wild willy jig. And my third cast, he said, the first cast hit there. The, the second cast hit there. And the third cast made it out there. And it went to the bottom, and as soon as it went to the bottom, he said, twitch it. I went, twitch it. And the third twitch, it went, and just doubled over. And then what he did, he stood there like this. He says, now I'm going to lift. And don't you reel that I tell you to reel. And he pumped it up like that. He said, now reel. And I reeled. He said, stop. Wait, 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 wait. Reel. Stop. And he was teaching me how to pump it in with a rod instead of the reel and not curl the key in my line. He said, you got that? And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and I'm like, Yee! and this thing went on and on and on. And he went down in the water, about shin deep water, and he grabbed this thing by the bottom lip. And all I could see as 10 years old was this fish kept coming. And it kept coming. And it was 41 inches and about 20, 21 pounds. First, snook, first time I ever went snook fishing, third cast. Well, first real cast. It was the night that ruined my life. <laughs> it was the night that was going to assure that I wouldn't do good in school, I wouldn't sleep at night, I wouldn't get a good credit rating, I wouldn't keep a wife or kids. Um, I'd be out snook fishing instead of going to the bar, but yeah, I got hooked. And we started going and going and going every chance I could on the weekends, and all the summer long, all I did was snook fish. We were driving down to, he'd take me in the station wagon, we'd go down to Venice, we'd go down to Inglewood, we'd go to Sarasota, we'd go to Bradenton sometimes all over. And by the time I was 14, I kind of, as he put it, he said the student became the teacher one night. Because we were, we were, we had beefed up our tackle. We were catching some pretty good snook. And I looked over and I saw these snook kind of piled up and, and some like, along some rocks. And I'm watching them and I go, wow. And he goes, those don't eat. Oh, uh, what do you mean they don't eat? Because I just saw some mullet about that big go over the top of them. And I went, ooh, apparently I need a mullet. <laughs> So I took a little cast net and went over and I cast netted mullet, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than that, probably about that big. And I slapped one on the hook and I flipped it out in front of him and I reel it. Boom, they hit that mullet. And he goes, give me a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> but we started catching, you know, lots of big snook and I started fishing with a lot of the old timers down there and really learning the game and I got, I got hooked. I mean, I spent my prom night, excuse me, on a bridge fishing. Yeah, I... Two and a half hours into the date, I was done. I took her home and went fishing. And uh, I drove around and then an AMC Pacer. I was the bomb. I was a fisherman who drove around in a fish tank. Anywho, that was a, I was hooked. But anywho, 
What I've learned about snook over the years is that they're really, really lazy, lethargic, stubborn, 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 stubborn. You know, I brought this tonight. This is nothing. People are going, what the heck is that? It's an actual, it's got a hole in here. It's designed as a bumper for your boat. Ain't no way I'm going to use this for a fish bumper. That's cool. I mean, I like that. Fish bumper, it'd get all tore up and the paint get knocked off it. Somebody ought to make these again. I went to a Florida sportsman show about 15 years ago and they were selling these. The guy brought in 200 of them. They were gone in two hours at $20 a piece. Poof. I bought one and I've never seen him again since. But he was gone. He was out. <clears throat> Anywho, the reason I brought this is to just, you don't have to worry about bringing in a mounted snook when you can pop this. You're not going to hurt it. But the snook's got a low slung jaw and when you, you got the, the, the high set eyes, it, the, that nose like a pike or a northern or musky or pike, but they're designed to lay into the tide like this. And you'll notice on a lot of big snook, a lot of big snook, <coughs> this anal fin and this the bottom of the tail are all scuffed up. They're kind of scraped up and scuffed up because they spend so much of their time sitting on the bottom. Just laying there like that. They're real bottom bowls. The big snook are bottom dwelling lazy fish. The little schoolies are the ones that are about this size, of course not this fat, but the snook about this size, they school up in huge schools. Huge pots, sometimes two, three hundred in a, in a school, and they'll just lay there all lined up facing into the tide. And I, I, my last trip out, I took Jan Mason, the outdoor writer from uh, Miami. He came up and was staying on Siesta Key in Sarasota, and I took him down to Venice. And we got about fi over 50 snook in a little under four hours that night between two of them. And I did it in one dock. Pulled up into a dock. You guys remember that real, real windy night last Saturday? That wind was coming in hard out of the north, about 20 knots. Well, we went down there, the wind was coming out of the north, the tide was coming in, the wind was driving, it. these snook were lined up, there was about 250, 300 snook lined up under one, one big giant underwater green light. And they were just lined up facing into the tide. And every single time you threw my little lure I call Cousin It, which is nothing more than a, uh, it's like a little skirt off of a bass buzz bait. And you flip this thing out there and just reel it like that, boom, 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 every, two at a time. Two at a time, two at a time. They got bored after a while. They're like, this is dumb, let's go in. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, I'm, he had to get up the next morning to fish with Rick Grassett, so. But we got about 50 snook in about four hours, but the uh, the snook fishing is, you know, the snook fishing is, re is really good right now. I'm hoping we don't get another really hard winter like 2010. The population's coming back. They're coming back in Bradenton. They're coming back in Terracilla. They're coming back in Terra Verde. I even talk to friends that are catching them in Pasco a little bit around the lights again. Not much. A lot of big trout over there and stuff. Um, but they, they're, they're starting to make a comeback. But a little bit about tackle, and I won't beat it down. For, there are three kinds of snook in my, kind of the way I describe it. There are three kinds of snook. There's snook, snooklets, then there's snook, and then there's snook. <laughs> snook is a whole different animal. That's a big old beast. That's like snookosaurus rex or snookzilla. Um, <laughs> That's a different animal. Well, when I'm just regular basic snook fishing, <laughs> snook, snooklets and snook, I'm using 15 to 20 pound braid, uh, 30 to 40 pound fluorocarbon leader, seven to seven and a half foot medium action spinner rods, about a 4,000 rip. And all, oftentimes people come up and they go, Shimano FX 4,000, isn't that about a $19 reel? I go, no, I pay 14 for them. <laughs> they go, you take your charters out with $14 reels and like $40 rods. And I go, mm-hmm. Have you ever seen what people can do to a rod and reel after six beers? <laughs> Whoa. Oh, yeah, I used to fish them with, you know, nice stratics and beautiful reels like that and watch them lay down with a strip hanging over, twop the boat it goes, or snap the rod because I had a G. Loomis. I don't know what it is with G. Loomis, but they seem to snap there all the time. Um, so I started going with these cheaper rods and reels, and guess what? They catch fish just as well as those fancy ones. And when I'm done with this reel, I throw it away. And when it gets a little wore out, starts acting funny, I give it to a kid in the neighborhood. If it gets really crazy, I keep it for parts. But I pay $14 for that reel, and that reel will fish like a champ. Now, when I step up to a larger snook, yeah, I'm not going to go with cheap reels. When I get to a little larger fish, these eight foot, medium, heavy, heavy action spinners, go to 8,000 spheros. At granted, that's not a Stella, but it's a nice, it's a nice reel. Right here, I've got 30 pound braid. This is a uh, uh, this right here is Power Pro. I've got 60 pound fluorocarbon leader, and that's for catching bigger snook, like 34 <coughs> to like 40 inch snook in a fairly open water situation. 
you start hooking 40, 42, 44 inch snook with some structure around, you're not going to want to hit with some heavy structure. You don't want to hit them with one of these. You'll get her attention. You won't stop her. She's 42, 44 inch and around a dock, around a bridge, or underneath some mangroves or some around some oysters, and she's just going to pow in a barrel. you going to tear you up. So when we get into some heavy fishing and some really big, big baits, and I keep these on here for one, if you have a lead weight on here, it keeps the lead weight from beating your blank up. Also, you can put a lure in here and keeps your hands from getting up. Those are kind of neat. Bass Pro carries those. But when I'm going for really big snuck, the big, big snuck, I'm using something like this. This is a Spiros 14,000. That's 100 pound Power Pro, 100 pound four carbon leader, and that is a nine knot, pretty much. You know, that's a bad to the bone hook right there. That's a, that's an owner right there. That's a nine hook. People go, do you really need that? And I go, mm -hmm. yeah. Cliff, do we need it? Yeah. <laughs> Bruce will tell you we need it, don't we? We need more than that. Yeah, we need more than that. Uh, Bruce, Bruce and I, it was, he and I and Cliff, we fish together a lot. Bruce and I have fished together for a long time. <clears throat> we go out at night with tackle like this, and we're throwing mullet. That big live. Actually, bigger tackle. Yeah, and bigger, you know, nine foot rods with, what do you got, an 18,000 spheros? Yeah. You got the biggest spheros made. Loaded with 100 and 100 and nine off forged hooks. And sometimes we'll grab a live lady fish that might be 18 to 20 inches long. And you take these live lady fish and you flip them out into the snook world and you watch these things get nervous. <coughs> and you're like, uh huh, uh huh. And I'm standing there behind Bruce with a video camera going, uh huh. And you see that line just go, point. And set the hook, and the, the last really big one Bruce caught was how long? 51. 51 inch. Wow. We guessed it of around 40 pounds. We didn't weigh it because we didn't want to hang it by its bottom lip. It was 51 inches long. I got a picture on my phone if nobody believes me. He's got a uh, replica of it on his wall, but it was around a 40 pound snook, and that one ate about a 21 inch light lady fish. Boom! Gone. And it <coughs> pulled you flat? Almost? I was standing in knee deep water on a sand bottom, and my feet had settled into the sand over my ankles. So when I set the hook, the fish pulled back harder than I set the hook, nearly pulled me face first into the water. But I was able to get one foot up, and then I'm fighting the fish flat-footed again, nearly did it all over again. It's a huge snook. It was, it was at least a 40-pound fish. And then it charged me. <coughs> yeah, it charged at it because it's coming at me like a shark. It was, it was a great fight, and the whole time, video camera wasn't recording. <laughs> That's the classic. Yeah, the video camera. Now, we didn't have, and I'm like, well, we recorded the part where he's holding him in the water, and he held it up like this for a picture and some video, and we got that part, but oh well, anywho, live and learn. But if we're going for really big giant stuff, we're going to tackle like this. Sometimes when we're bridge fishing, I grew up fishing uh, on bridges a lot. That's where I really started in pier bridge fishing, seawall fishing. Never used a boat, and I found that you can catch just as many snook without a boat as you can from a boat. Land fishing is fantastic for snook. In fact, I used to work at the Colony on Bayshore Boulevard. I was a waiter, and Wes Sargentson came in from Channel 8 one night, and he says, I hear you catch a lot of snook. I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, I'd like to do a little story on you, and I'm like, okay. So we went out, we drove up and down the coast, and he caught about 45 snook that night in about six hours from his feet. And then he aired it on Channel 8. He says, just give him a hook, and he'll catch a snook. And it was kind of a goofy little catchphrase. But anywho, we took him, and he aired that on Channel 8. And I had about 350 phone calls in the next three days wanting to go. I quit my job, and I started running land charts. And then one night, I had Tell a... Tell them about the truck. Well, well, Tell them about what you were driving when you started this. Oh, yeah, beat, beat up old truck. And uh, one of the fellows that was uh, that went to Homeport Marina, there was a couple of guys that I took. They were very wealthy men. And they said, Dave, could you do this out of a boat? Sure. I don't have a boat. And I don't have any money for a boat. We'll buy you a boat. You just take us for free. So they bought me a boat. <laughs> they bought me an 18-foot uh, Robert Snucker flats boat. It was 17.9. And they bought me a little truck to pull it with. And I those guys fishing a total of three times piece. 
One died and the other one moved to the Keys. <laughs> I felt horrible about that. <laughs> it was weird. I was like, and I called his wife, when do you want me dishes? Dave, no, I'm not going to miss it. We've got millions and I'm not. And I was like, okay, thank you. God bless you. <laughs> and then I took Frank Sargent. I took Frank Sargent out and he said, you're a madman. He said, uh, you're right. And that's where the mad snooker came from. Frank Sargent gave me a goofy nickname. But anyway, a little bit about that. Let's talk. Let's go back to snooker. The best way to find snook is to think of a calendar like winter, spring, summer, fall. Winter time snook, they're inside power plants, warm water outflows, residential canals, creeks. Um, they come back in these deep, muddy rivers. They go back in the Alify. They go back in the. They'll go back up in the Peace River, the Palm River, Hillsborough River, Philippi Creek, Shackett Creek down in Venice, Godfrey Creek in Venice, uh, Inglewood. All the creeks. They go all the way up the Hillsborough River. Oftentimes we used to go up the Hillsborough River and we did some crazy stuff. Did anybody remember on Nebraska Avenue where the dog track is? Okay. There was an old yacht club back there with some shuffleboard courts. And behind the yacht club with the shuffleboard courts where there was a dock. When it rained a lot on the outgoing tide, the Nebraska Street Bridge. We would stand on the Nebraska Street Bridge with these. Stand on and we would throw these bombers toward the bridge, let them sweep a little bit, drop the rod tip load and start cranking, and you hooked a snook almost every cast, and they averaged about 12 to 15, 18 pounds. And it was one after another, but you talk about a crazy place to fish. That's a rough neighborhood at night. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, yeah, we had one guy come down there, he was dressed in, uh, you know, the road crew. He ran off from the road crew, and he was hiding. See anybody? Don't tell him I'm here. We're like, okay. <laughs> Not a problem. Anywho. Okay, back to this. When you're fishing for snook with something like this, I, my favorite go-to bait is a live shrimp for live bait. Live, my favorite live bait is a live shrimp. I like live pinfish. I like live finger mullet. But usually it's live shrimp or small pinfish and stuff like that for, for rig like this. And if I'm going to use an artificial like this, a DOA shrimp, I want a natural color. That to me is the closest to a live shrimp color, and I have had great success with that. I've tried these to no avail. There's no point in my life have I ever seen a glowing dark shrimp. Never seen one. Neither has a snook. And a lot of times you have this thing lit up and it goes by them and they go, whoa, it's a power plant snook. <laughs> <laughs> been too close to Big Ben or whatever. The new, we got a nuclear power plant around here? I don't know. Anywho, but they don't, I've never had any good luck with those. But these I've had great luck with. If I want to catch a snook with a rig like this on artificial, my go-to bait for many, many years, I used to go to John's Pass, Blind Pass, and Pass the Grill. And I would pull this little pink shad body thing out, and everybody would go, nice lure, Dave. That sure is pretty. And my, my one buddy called it the, the pink sissy bait. And I go, yeah, watch what this pink sissy bait will do. And I get there right at a certain part of the tide, and it usually was like the last 20 minutes of the incoming. And I would throw this thing out to the bottom of like blind pass. I'd twitch it three times. Doom, doom, doom. I go, watch this. Boom. One after another. I mean, 12 to 20 pound snook on that little jig right there. As many, I mean, there were nights, at, at, you know the little bar in blinds pass, I think called Woody's? There's a little bar there. I had people, they would, everybody would stop what they're doing watching me catch snook. And they kept, and they kept wanting to see what I was using. Kept wanting to see what I, and I kept going like this. And I wouldn't let him see it. That was, no, I didn't want him. And I, I didn't show him quite what I was doing. But we caught a lot of snook out there. But that's a, I like to jig at night. One of my favorite ways to, to fish is to jig. And whenever you're jig fishing, you want that jig to hit the bottom, twitch it up, hit the bottom. And the snook tend to pounce on that bait on your jigs as they're falling down. Now, when you're fishing like the East Coast <coughs> with jigs, you got to have a much heavier jig head. That's why I go with these. These are called the DDX. Uh, David Justice's son, uh, he makes these. His name's Dylan Justice. He, he pours these heads. He makes the heads. He pours the tails, everything. They're called DDX. They will eat these things alive on the East Coast. They tear them up at night on the inlets around the bridges and docks. That is a fantastic bait. But I like to jig fish. I'm not a big fan of treble hooks. So I've kind of gotten away from using these. Every once in a while I'll go back to it, but if I do use it, I'll take my pliers and I'll crush the barbs flat. I don't like leaving these barbed up because it's so hard to unhook a fish and they mangle the fish's head. And 
oftentimes when you're on the East Coast and the deep, <coughs> deep inlets over there, people are, you don't, don't associate that with snook fishing, do you? Troll a CD-18 Magnum Rapala. You troll the inlets over there with these CD-18s about 70 to 80 feet behind the boat. You're just trolling them out the back. And they'll be down 30, 35 feet. Just bam! They'll hit it like a big grouper. And you got huge snook. We've caught snook over 35 pounds trolling these. We used to troll them at Hollow in Miami all the time, David Justice and I. And uh, these things got, we, we've caught many a snook over 30 pounds on these. That is a really good technique. Troll inlets, but you need an inlet that's deep for the CD-18. If it's not that deep, you can go back to trolling something like the regular old Magnum Bomber, Long A. And I, as you notice, that's the red and white. That's what I go with. I try to look for natural colors. If I'm casting, um, if I want to work um, something really deep and I want to work it slow, this is my go-to lure. Uh, again, back to my friend David Justice. He came up with a, with a solution to a problem. A lot of times when you're fishing a swim bait and it goes down and you're cranking that bait along the bottom and the snook hits it, he gets hooked and the weight of the lure itself, he goes like this, he shakes his head and then whoosh, throws, the, throws the lure, throws the swim bait. That happens so much. We had a lot of problems. Dave was working for Berkeley, and he developed a Berkeley swim bait. It was about the size of this, and it's close in profile, but it kept throwing it. So what Dave came up with, he stuffed the lead, the hook on the lead. He, he carved out a hole and stuffed it in there. Well, he needed a, a better solution, so he came up with this. Now, it's, this is called spool tech. And when you're cranking this along the bottom, and the snook hits it, you set the hook, the hook deploys away from the bait. Do they work, Cliff? <laughs> they work. <laughs> First cast? Cliff was like, are you kidding me? That was a big snook. That was, yeah. About a 25-pounder right in Venice Inlet. And I, I threw the spool tech, and I go, Cliff, grab my phone. Cliff videotaped the whole goofy video. But uh, when you're done, you want to hook them. If you need to change the tail, you simply can just pop the tail out, drop a new tail in it like that, line it up on the slot pop it back in, and then you unhook the fish, and uh, you simply just roll it, turn the wheel. It's got a wheel on top of it. You roll it back in. And it's the most amazing new innovative bait I've seen come along since the DOA products. And they sell them at Bass Pro, and they sell a lot of the tackle, tackle shops in Sarasota and Brayton and like Discount Tackle. And no, I don't no, I don't get a, a dime for telling you about them. The only thing I get is the satisfaction that you might go out and do better with them. But these are one amazing look, and they really, really do work. And you will stop it. They will just take the leverage away from the fish. And I've got some, uh, I've got some videos on uh, the Mad Snooker channel on YouTube showing them in action. Uh, you can, if it says anything, go on YouTube and just type in Spool Tech, S P O O L T E K, and uh, you'll see them in action. They are incredible. I'm <coughs> wheeling that one in. But when you're fishing with big live bait with a rod like this, my favorite go-to bait with a rod this size would be a pinfish. And the reason I like a pinfish so much is they can almost live in a bucket of mud if you aerate them. They're really, really, really durable. They're flashy. They're hyper. They're tough. You can cast them quite a bit more than you can. Yes, a grunt is a good bait. A pigfish is a fantastic bait. Cast a pigfish three times, he's usually done. You can cast a live pinfish the size of your hand 10, 12 times if he doesn't get hit. He's still got a little bit of good flutter to him. Where a grunt is like, just hanging there on your hook, going, Ugh. Snook does not get excited about a grunt going by going, Ugh. That just says, don't eat me. When he goes by the first time going, I'm a living rattletrap. That's when he gets hit. When he's kicking like a live rattletrap, throwing off the vibration, throwing off the electricity, throwing off the excitement, he'll get hit. Problem when you're using a grunt or a pigfish, he goes to the bottom. And I don't care if it's... If it's down there and it's a rock that big, he's going to find a way under it. A, a big fish or a grunt will find the bottom, any hole, any structure, he'll go right under it. Where a pinfish kind of hangs in the medium part of the water column. He may go down deep, but he never looks for something to go under. And he gets chased. He just takes off like a living rattle trap, and you can feel him like shemp on the end of your line. Woo, 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 rah, rah, rah. And then you wait for the Thalston to pick up the slack and pull. I like circle hooks because you don't have to... Um, really set the hook in the inlets at night when I'm fishing big inlets with higher heavy current, you'll get these bow in your line. So you can't get that slack quick enough. 
and all of a sudden you, you'll just see it in the moonlight or the ambient street light or the condo lights off in the background. You'll see the line just go, this tiniest little bump. And all of a sudden you just start cranking. Just crank as fast as you can and whoop, it'll come tight. Now if you're fishing, you hook into a 25, 30 pound snook on a big pinfish with a rod like this with say 60 pound braid on it with 80 pound fluorocarbon leader with about a five or six knot incoming tide, it can be a challenge, especially if he's 25, 28, 30 pounds. Those fish will just absolutely just barrel through the inlet. As Bruce knows, <laughs> we've been out there many a night, just one after another. <coughs> every bait, every bait you throw in there. I, everybody, anybody familiar with uh, Glenn Plot, the average angler? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had Glenn out there one night, and uh, he had Jeff Holloway on board uh, with Baby's Nine Anchor. And um, Glenn, <coughs> you, you're recording this, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> Turn it off for a second. No, it's okay. It's door. <laughs> I kept baiting Glenn's hook with pinfish. I baited my hook with grunts. He never knew that. He's going to know it now. Sorry, Glenn. It was <laughs> a dirty <laughs> trick. <laughs> but what I was doing is I took, the, I took the grunts and I'd throw them out there and go, boom, and I'd hand the rod to Jen and the cameras would come on. I kept baiting his with pinfish, and nothing, nothing. They, that night, they wanted grunts. And after about four or five big big ones, like slobs, like 25 pounds, you know, all over Jen, he's like, he's going, what's going on? And I just went, mm, and I kind of felt bad, so I baited him with a grunt. As soon as he threw it out, he got one. <laughs> so there are times when the grunt's the, the go-to bait. Wow, I hope Glenn doesn't watch. Sorry, Glenn, it was just a joke. <laughs> I just was messing with him. I wanted I wanted Jen to do good that night. And I apologize for any time any of you had to watch Count Snuckular. <laughs> Whoa. That was that was bizarre. I don't really ever want to do it again, but <coughs> I bet he'd be talking into it tomorrow. I, it's just kind of goofy. But um back to uh something like this. When you're seawall fishing or pier fishing or dock fishing, when you're like Cliff and I, I, I woke Cliff up, what was that, about 1 in the morning? 2.30. 2.30? Not that you're really counting. <laughs> I said, Cliff, get down here. And I had a big... I woke you up then night. No, no, I was just yeah. hanging out. <laughs> I was down, in, I was fishing in Venice. Cliff lives right in Venice, <coughs> right, right by where I was fishing. And my clients had just left, and I had, a, I had some big uh, white lady fish left over. And so Cliff goes, I, I call Cliff, I go, get down here. And I had this giant, giant bait tank on the front of the boat, on the bow of the boat, because I didn't have my new boat ready. And, and I, I said, Cliff, get down here. I got this monster stuck in the front of my boat. And uh, so I'm like, Mike Mahoney's here. I didn't miss nothing, did I? No. Oh. <laughs> so I have this huge stuck sitting in the front of the boat, and, and I was looking at it, and I go, you know, man, she, I, I was trying to revive her. She revived, revived good, and I'm like, I got to get her back. So I put her back. And then Cliff sh hasn't shown up yet. But he got so, in, in his haste to get down there, because he was so excited to come down, because I had a bunch of big bait left, what'd you do? You I are. flew to my feet, I ran out to the car, I got halfway to the Honda, and I realized I had put my pants on. <laughs> <laughs> he ran outside in his underwear. <laughs> so, he shows up, and I go, Cliff, I go, look at that. And he's looking at about, what, 26, 27 pounds snook, and I go, I go, so we, I, he, he takes a picture of it, and I go, here, Cliff. I grab a hook just like this. I, I get the hook out and I ease it down. And I grab another ladyfish out and I, and I hook that thing on there and I go, here, take this. And he's standing on top of the dock with this, probably this exact rod and reel. And he's letting it out, letting it out, letting it out. So then, boom! That was a good snook. That was another 20, 23, 24 pound snook. But when you're fishing around a heavy, heavy structure with big mullet, big sand perch, maharas, some people call them maharas, silver jennies, the goats. You know the striped maharas are real tall. Uh -huh. They got a big fin. Yeah. They're nasty big old baits. Well, when you're using one of those, the way I like to fish a mahar, and done it for years, um, what we do is we grab the mahar by the head like this, and the you know, the top dorsal fin be right here. And we flip them upside down, and we go right where they're basically, for lack of a better term, where the butthole is. And we pop the air bladder, pop, and bring the hook out sideways like that. And what you do with him then is you lower, you lower him down into the feeding station or into the eddy, wherever you're at, 
and you lower it into the eddy or into the feeding station up tight of the eddy, and that thing will take off. I'm talking a mahara like that big, like a pound and a half, two pounds. It'll take off like a bat out of heck and just whoa, 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 and you, you leave the spool open and you keep your hand on the spool like that, or you can do a conventional forearm and you can just pat line like that and you're feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, and all of a sudden you'll feel that thing absolutely just trembling the whole rod, running away from the snook, and then you will feel the most insane, solid, thumping hit you've ever felt in your life from a snook. You will swear it's a 200-pound Goliath eating a stingray. They, they hit them so hard. I've never seen anything get hit harder than a, than a mar. And they hit that thing and then boom, and then you reel up your slack and you smack them. But, yeah, if you've never fished with a live sand perch, I highly recommend trying it. Um, around here, the bridge that runs right over the Peace River on 41 right down there by the boat ramp, Stay on top of that bridge with a, you know, three in the morning, you know, pack up an attitude adjuster with you, just in case, and uh, don't go alone, and get a great big, get a big mahar, and walk out on that bridge, and then don't go to the upcurrent side. You can try it, flip it out upcurrent, let it drift back, but if you got an outgoing tide, I would be facing to the west, and i just drop it down behind the pounds and let it sweep away from the bridge. Whoa, there's some big snook in there. When the Palm River Spillway used to, I used to sneak into the Palm River Spillway many years ago, right by the soap plant behind the Orient Road Jail. And we would crawl around, we'd park around by the soap plant and go around by the railroad tracks and then we'd walk up to where the spillway was. What we did there is we threw uh, bomber long A's and uh, sometimes uh, jigs, and we caught all the snook we ever wanted to catch there. But we got caught in there one night by the state trooper who lived in the trailer right there. He said, you can't be doing that. So we came back with a boat. And then we quickly realized that it was out of range. So then we took a radio-controlled tugboat with clothespins on the back of it, and we would literally tow our boat. We would let it, it would tow our live bait all the way up. We towed pinfish and sometimes bluegill all the way up. And before they even got to the spillway, a lot of times they get yanked off the back of the tugboat, and one of us would be driving the tugboat back. And the, the state trooper came out, and he went like this, and he lit it up, and he went, that's so ingenious, I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. And he goes, he just, wow. And what he, what he did have a problem was with was Kinko the clown fishing, because the radar control broke, gave up with all the salt in it. And then I was over, this is a true story, nobody believes me, and I will pull it out of my footlocker and bring it in next time. I went to my nephew's, and he had this clown that rode on a wire across his bedroom. When it bumped into the wall here, it went the other way. When it bumped into the wall, it went back. And I looked at that and I went, hmm, clothes been under him, a couple more batteries, rubber bands, he'd go ahead on, he would probably stay on a fishing line, and he was balanced with the thing. Sure enough, so I went to the where the spillway was, with a, with tied to the, bump, the barrels, and it's a long shot with a big surf rod. Lobbed a weighted treble hook over the top of the, over the top of the fence of the spillway, pulled it tight into the rod holder, got up on a step ladder in a John boat, which is stupid, on a you know step ladder, <laughs> loaded up Kinko the clown with a clothespin, with a jig or a lure or a live bait, and let him send him on up. And he'd bump into the top of the spillway and he'd yank it out. You just you'd have your line like this, and you go boom, and you pull it out of the clothespin, it'd fall in. Kinko wouldn't be halfway back, and you'd have a big snook on. Well, the same true story. And I'm gonna find this trooper. He came out and he went, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> he goes, you're the same guys with the tugboat, right? And I go, yes, sir. And he goes, now, how are you going to get that line off the top of my fence? I went, <laughs> he goes, don't do that one again. So we did. But I still have that clown in a footlocker, and I'm going to put it on Facebook. That was the, the most crazy thing I think I ever did to go snook fishing for me. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to teach you a little about snook, but i got to share some stupid stories with you. So. <laughs> One more dumb story and I'm done. I'm going to get into some real detail. Um, we are in Blind Pass one night, fishing just north of Woody's Bar, and there was a condo right there. And to sneak into the, where the condo was, you had to jump a wall. Well, if you jump the wall, here's Woody's Bar back to you. Golf's over here to your, your, your left. And if you jumped over the wall, there was these docks in there, and it was, they all lit up, and they held a lot of 16 to 20-pound snook. They're a nice big snook. And my friend Min, you know, a little Vietnamese guy that used to work Birking, he's like, you know, hey man, we got, I found some big snook. And I'm like, really, where? And he, he told me, and I went there with another buddy of mine, and we were over there, and like, so we, we had a big Calcutta. You remember the Calcutta cane poles, the big Burma rods? Well, 
I flipped one over with a shrimp about that big on big jumbo shrimp I got from Gandy Bait Tackles, and I flipped it over. It did a boom, and I did what old Clyde Parrish from Ballast Point Pier used to do, and I slammed that thing into the ground like that, and I two-handed it, slung that snook up over the wall. Well, it hit him dead in the chest. <laughs> it knocked the snook, and my buddy went into the swimming pool, made so much noise with that snook flashing around the pool that the lights were coming on the condo. I'm like, uh-oh. He grabbed, I pulled the snook out of the pool, he grabbed the snook, stashed the rod, in the, the cow cut a rod in the bushes, threw the snook over the wall. We're running down the road, lapping our butts off, threw the truck, drove off, and we weren't gone three minutes, and the red and blues are going the other way. We're like, <laughs> went back four days later, that cow cut pole was still in the bushes. Three days later, whatever it was. Yeah, but I've done some crazy things to go fishing. I've snuck into power plants. She, uh, one more, okay. You know the big, the, the Anclo power plant? Yeah, we used to crawl around the barrels, and go up under the bushes dressed in full camouflage. If you threw that way, you caught trout. If you threw to the right, you were catching snook, and if you threw out, you were hooking cobia. And we came out of there with a rucksack, army rucksack, a huge trout, and I sold them because, well, I needed money back then. But let the snook go, but that, we did a lot of crazy stuff back then. But <clears throat> This was last week? <laughs> <laughs> I used to stay on top of the 41 bridges. We went over the Manatee River with a curve this that wide. Standing there like that, with a curb that wide like that, and cars and trucks going behind you 60, 70 miles an hour, three feet away, catching snook. I didn't think anything of it. You know, I was young, dumb, and I was going to live forever. I had to dream on. Um, lucky to be alive for some of the stupid stuff I did to fish. But when you, again, match the hatch. Use indigenous looking baits, natural looking bait, baits. Um, when they're eating shrimp, by God, give them shrimp. Those fall shrimp runs when they dump out in September, October, right now. These big moons on the outgoing tide, there'll be a lot of shrimp pulling off these flats, going out the intercoastal, down toward the inlets and passes, depending on the air temperature, water temperature. So when they're eating shrimp, give them shrimp. When they're eating glass minnows, you got a problem. When they're eating glass minnows, you got to be pretty good with a fly rod. Now, a lot of people that I take fishing, uh, I do take quite a bit of fly fishermen fishing, and then I cover up the hardware on the front of the boat with wet towels so nothing gets snagged up. And But those who don't like to fly fish but still want to catch these snook, they're eating glass minnows. Well, that's when I whip out my little cousin it lure, <clears throat> or I'll take a fly. Clear plastic cork, clear, fill it up with water, it, weight it, it adds weight, but it's clear. You run it about five feet above the leader, five feet above the fly. Now you've got a clear, clear cork full of water for weight, and your fly's about five, six feet behind it on a spinning rod. You flip that thing out there and just go, just like a, you just like, it's like you're stripping it, but you're doing it with this. You're working the fly just like a fly fisherman would, but you're doing it with a spinner rod. Wham! It works. It makes fly fishermen mad. Those purists. <laughs> Look at this idiot fishing a fly on a spinner. It, we're catching fish, you know. That's the same guy, that, you know. When the fly fishermen come by and they've got their beautiful shirt and their tiny little, and their pretty little khaki pants <coughs> and their pretty shoes and their boat without a spot on it and they're going, whoosh, whoosh, and I'm drifting by going, <laughs> With a hundred pound test and a 14 inch mullet just got nailed. And I got a, a true story. About a 35 pound snook came up under his bow, jumped like five feet in front of him, my line off. And I go, He's going under your boat, man. He's going. And I, of course, I'm like, you know, I may as well bend as redneck as they could get. I was born in Waterville, Maine, but I, I'm a redneck at heart. <laughs> um, we've caught a lot of big, big snook in over the years. But when the best way to um, think of a snook counter. Winter in, spring coming out, fall. So, well, it's winter, winter, winter. They're inside, warm water canals, deep residential canals, rivers, creeks, deep channels, ship channels. Spring they're coming out, summer they're out, fall they're coming back in. Just think of it that way. But find them where they're at. Think like think about the calendar. Use natural looking baits, indigenous baits. Use natural presentations. You've got to be stealthy. You gotta sneak up on your snook. Beer has nothing to do with catching snook. <laughs> nothing. Radios have nothing to do with catching snook. I see guys out there all the time with their with their this light on and that light on and these underwater lights on the back of their boat. I'm going, yeah, are those there every night? They're not, then what good are they doing? They have to be consistent. They're good for catching bait, but they're not good for drawing snook to the back of your boat. It'll work, but it's not good. I see, you know, they're out there clanging around with their beer and they're stomping the cooler and they got their radio on and they're not catching anything. They're having a good time, God bless them, you know. But they're not thinking, you got to sneak up on a snook. You got to slide in there quiet. Ease, if you're going to use an anchor, 
roll that anchor down really, really quiet. If you're going to use a trolling motor, I recommend a Rodan, the Rodan trolling motor with a GPS. Bruce got me hooked on those. You press anchor, boom, holds you there. You set a pattern going down a, a canal full of docks, and you save that, and then you go back and you, to the start, and you go boop, and that darn boat will drive itself all the way through, and all you do is fish. Now, will it, anchor, will it stop at anchor points, preset? It will. If you don't exactly remember where you were, you hit anchor, that numbered anchor, it will go to where that spot was. It's pretty cool. It's like the iPilot, but it's Minn Kota. And I, I, I've, I mean, it's, it's Rodan, and I, I've had a little better, uh, you know, people I've talked to have been a little better luck with the Rodan, being a little more dependable, but, you know, six and one half dozen the other. Um, match the hatch, match the size of the bait, according to size of, match size of the hook, according to size of the bait. Using live shrimp, small white bait, thread fin greeny, size two. My favorite go-to shrimp, book is a 92, 670, uh, one size two, not a two, but size two. It's a bronze hook. It's a tiny little bronze hook. Tough little book. <coughs> Tough. They, they really can take a lot, of, a lot of pressure before they open up. Uh, my favorite uh, pinfish. If they're like, say, a four or five inch pinfish, I use about a four odd. But I'll use, I'll use a silver hook. I use a dark colored hook when I use a dark bait. I use a silver hook when I use a silver bait. I use a flashy hook with a flashy bait. Am I overthinking it? Maybe a little bit. Um, the brommer is crucial. I don't want high steady brommer. If I go outside, there's not a single cloud. There's no wind. And I got a bright, beautiful, clear moon, and they're just dead still. High brommer camped out over the state, and I see the big eight <coughs> over Florida. I go, oh, they're going to be stubborn. And they are. They're going to be very, very stubborn. Um, but if you go outside, there's a 25 mile an hour wind like I had with Jan Mason the other night. And the tide's coming in, and you got the wind driving it, and the clouds are blowing over your head, and you hear the gulf roaring off in the distance, rump, you know, waves crashing. They're biting. They're chewing. They're a foul weather fish. Unfortunately, if there's a water spout coming across the bay with lightning crashing off in the distance, <laughs> the snook are biting. Not the best time to be out there with an eight foot graphite lightning rod, but like the uh, priest in the movie <laughs> Caddyshack. Going, Damn you! <laughs> Don't tempt fate, but um, if the weather's foul, the snook are biting. I mean, uh, I think it's a lot like that. Even I'm not a bass fisherman, but a lot of the bass fishermen have told me that in foul weather, the fishing's better. Mike, would you agree that foul weather fishing, they bite better? I mean, I've seen it where it's not necessarily in the middle of it, but getting into it, definitely. You know? Yeah, getting, getting ahead of the front. Yeah. You fish with Ernie Rubio a lot, right? I have. Yeah, he, he always, he, he said he liked foul weather fishing. You don't ever have to worry about somebody following. <laughs> Not learning <with Ernie> Rubio <laughs> or you. <laughs> they know better. Yeah, Rubio, man, that's a tough character right there, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, if you're in a bar fight, you want them on your side. But, you know, there are so many good lures out there. This one right there, this right here is big. This is a DOA. It's called a VFB, a big bait. <laughs> fish bait. Big, fi big, big, big fish bait. This is the VFB, big fish bait, and uh, they'll, they'll knock the tar out of these things. You, you flip these things out, then they got a little lip you can put in them, and they just blah, 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 blah. But if you want to get a little more extreme, this thing right here, at the low, low price of about $30 a piece, I don't guide for these. This little doodad right here, when you crank this thing through a bunch over, over the top of a bunch of snook that are whacking mullet, and they see this, it's a mullet. I, I, I'm scared to throw this with anything less than my 100 pound test because I don't want to lose it. I've caught five or six big snook on the, its twin brother. There's twin brothers all beat up. I haven't thrown this one yet. This is my reserve. I got this at uh, Bill Jackson's in St. Petersburg. You know that tackle shop you can't find that's hidden in the trees? Um, and to this day, um, maybe somebody can read the bottom, but I can't without the glasses. But. Oh, what's it called? <coughs> Can you read it? Uh, swim bait DBZ1. Passing. Okay. Oh, SPRQ. I don't know. They, Bill Jackson. S-Pro. 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 Oh, yeah, S-Pro. And I got that at Bill Jackson's. And the other, <coughs> its twin brother has caught five huge snook, and I haven't thrown this one yet. I'm keeping it reserved. But I've never seen anything swim like this. And they, the snook crush it. We've got some spots where we snook fish where the snook will only bite 
the first hour of sunup. From, from the time you get a little bit of daylight where it's just getting lit till the sun comes up for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, pushing it, and it's off. It's done. And that, that's where I've done really good on the BFB bait and that, that bait right there and live mullet. We, it's a little, it's a, they're, what they are, there's just little sea walls and these snook lay there. Or as, a, as the mullet come around the corner first thing in the morning as they push on the outgoing tide, it has to be an outgoing tide. You flip your mullet up there, it comes around the corner, just boom, gone. Big, and these are big snook, really big. Um, if I'm going to go for beach fishing in the summertime, one of my favorite go-to baits is the DOA Terrorize right here. I love that bait. Maybe even the little smaller one, but I go with a much with a light rod, and I'm not worried about throwing it way out. What I'm doing is you're throwing it down the beach in the trough. Like in Venice, there's a place called Casperson's Beach. With all those rock piles, they stick out to the Gulf. You know, just don't go into the woods. <laughs> You'll be followed back by some sweet men. It's very famous to that, but anywho, <laughs> it's a famous beach for that. But um, it's also famous for snook and shark's teeth. Huge shark yeah, tooth collection right. down there. But what I've got done uh, is I go down there to Casperson's first thing in the morning or it's sundown for really good. And you take the DOA, terrorize, and the rock piles are sticking out. You <coughs> flip these terrorize out there as far out, all the way to the end of the rock piles if you can, get in the water about that deep. And you just crank it down the side of those, and man, oh man, do they tear these things up. And the, and the bait buster also. If, if it's a nice, calm, calm night, and the, and the surf's kind of nice and barely rolling in, uh, bait buster's good. If it's a little rougher surf, I want to go with the terrorize. It makes it easier to use artificial a lot of times where you go, because you don't have to lug live bait. I don't want to lug live bait. I've got carts and bait trailers and... Um, in my brochure, my crazy, super, super goofy brochure here, um, I like to, people, you know, people go, you catch any stuff? I go, no. So I got a little carried away. You can have some of these if you want them. But there's a bait trailer on the back of that. I built a trailer just to haul bait around. It had a 200-gallon oval and a 200-gallon round tank on the back of it. We hauled it behind the truck and we fill it with bait. My first version of this sits over next to Gandy Bait and Tackle. It looks like a coffin on a trailer. Big white coffin. I'm sure Ernie has used it, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think Billy uses it for a water truck. If it's still intact, I mean, that trailer's getting rough. But I built that years ago. And what we do is we haul, we, we load it up with big live mullet, and we spot hop. We jump from spot to spot to spot. We might start in Bradenton, and by morning, it's time to turn around because we're in, we're, we're in Fort Myers. Um, there's some places down there. If we can catch some big snook if the mosquitoes don't kill us. But those ones down there, they could kill a chicken flat-footed. I'm telling you, there's some nasty, nasty mosquitoes. Okay, you tell them where the mosquitoes are following you. Yes, I don't know what it is, but I'm a mosquito magnet. But I don't know. But you go down a big Carlos Pass where the state record was caught uh, by a guy named De Cosmos. A little trivia, it was Bozo the Clown's. The original Bozo the Clown's son, De Cosmo. It was a bridge tender, Big Carlos Pass Bridge, and one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, the tide was slack. He was using a, a flowering floor, a bucktail jig. He caught a 44-pound, 3-ounce snook off the bridge. When I heard that, I had to go there. <laughs> so I went there, and we were getting consistent 25, 30-pounders there every night. But the mosquitoes are bad there. You've got to wear, like, combat gear. They're bad. But it, there's some big, big tarpon in but some of the biggest snook you'll ever find in the west coast of Florida are in Fort Myers. Fort Myers, Cape Coral, there's some just giant snook down there, Sanibel, Captiva. There, if you, it's worth a drive. It's just kind of a haul. For up this way, you know, I, I really don't fish north of Bradenton anymore. I just kind of quit after the 2010 freeze. I know it's coming back. But up this way, I know the South Shore, it's like the name of the club. South Shore still got a lot of snook. I was talking to Snooky Bear at Art Piva. Um, the other night while we, he and I were filming with Glenn Plaw in the studio, we just aired this past Sunday, uh, he was telling me that if they're starting to really make a nice comeback, are, are they doing it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, not as much as they were, but who's to say, you know, if they're coming back good, yeah, a lot of yeah. off, a lot of over. Mike would know. Everybody know Mike Mahoney, right? That's a yeah. landmark, buddy. If they ain't got it, quit looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, too. That's the coolest story. Have you, have you talked your gator yet? <coughs> Yeah, beat that. That's still a big gator. Did you see that thing on the discovery channel with that crocodile they caught? Yeah, 20-something foot. 
22 feet or whatever it was, 21, they transported it to a, it's alive still. It's amazing. But anyway, um, back to you. Okay, so let's see. With, uh, with liter fluorocarbon mono, I don't think it really matters. I still use mono at night sometimes, just to try it to see if it really, were we missing out back then? Well, if we were fishing with Dacron, we were. And the rubber band action, there's nothing better than a two ounce um, bucktail, like a, a, a flare hawk, about two ounces on 30 pound mono, with a mono floor, you know, a piece of mono at 60 liter, with about 100, 150 feet of 30 pound mono out there, all stretched out with a 25 pound snook when he comes up and spits it, and that rubber band comes back. <laughs> Incoming! Well, you don't get that off a braid. You still get a little, but not even close to the rubber band. It was dangerous. I mean, it's, whoo, I've seen some pictures on, I um, mean, whoo. Oftentimes when you're fighting a snook, I always say, pull the fish the opposite way of the other people on the boat. If you got people on the boat to your left and the snook's to your right, I still pull them to the right. Because I don't want to pull them this way because if he comes up and spits, boom, that rod's torqued over this way, that hook flies right back at the faces on the boat. And people always say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I do that all the time on the boat. I go, because you got that rod perfectly lined up to that snook spits, I'm going to catch that hook in the face. And I stopped guiding with heavy jigs. I stopped guiding with many years ago. I, 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 I was not going to hand anybody one of these because everyone has a license to take your head off with it. And I, I've seen some crazy stuff. Um, I, don't, I, I don't take people to do this very often. And I, I know that sounds kind of, you know, I would say about 30 to 40. 30% of the people I take fishing are pretty doggone good experienced fishermen. They impress me. And then the other 70% maybe should stick to golf. But um, <laughs> And that sounds horrible, doesn't it? But I, I, I've, I've actually turned around. I've, I've, I can't tell you how many I've turned around. And uh, I've turned around. I've to turn back around to see the guy getting ready to cast like this. Aww. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, well, the handle's on the wrong side. And he's reeling like this. And I go, it reverses. And he's like, really? Oh, could you reverse it? <laughs> God bless him. He's fishing. He's having a good time. When is the best time to go snook fishing? When you have time. But if you were going to pick a best time to go snook fishing, I would say a Monday night with a good time around a good moon when there's a great Monday night football game on in the fall. Or this, well, can't do much about football in the spring. But in the, this time of year, it'll be a Monday night when there's a good Monday night football game with a good tide, possibly a front moving in with a good moon. That's You can't get any better than that. There's going to be nobody on the water. Front's moving in. Everybody figures it's going to be rough out there. Well, yeah, it might be a little rough, but it won't be that bad. But the snook will be biting, and there won't be anyone out there because everybody's watching football. I, I even remind all the fishermen, you got to watch that game tonight, right? <laughs> it's a big Monday night game on tonight, you know? But... Well, when you have time to go fishing. But if you make great catches under the, those circumstances when you went, log it. What was the tide doing? What was the barometer doing? What was the solar table doing? Moon, you got your majors, moon over, moon under, moon rise, moon set, those are your minors. If the moon was uh, due to be high over, you were going to get the direct over at, say, 2 a.m., but you had a high tide that was going to reach high at about 1, maybe, maybe 12.40 a.m., you want to be there at 11.30 fishing to about 1.30. You want to fish at the peak end of that tide around that moon phase and just a little after that moon phase. But you'll notice a lot of times the snook, before you even see the moon come up, the snook will bite from here before you see it come up to about there. Then they slow down. But they bit right from this moon to that moon. When the moon gets up here, boop, they're done. Now they might come back on when the tide changes, but nothing like they did from here to there. And it's all about the, that solar table. It's huge. If you've got cats and they're getting crazy at home, running around, I promise you, look at the solar table. I bet it lines up with when those cats get crazy. If you've got fish in an aquarium at home that suddenly get active and start feeding, check the solar table. If the cows are up feeding, the fish are biting. If the cows are laying down, the fish aren't biting. It's so true. When the game's active. I'm not a hunter. I, I know nothing about hunting. And I'm certainly not going to try to pull a gator into my boat. <laughs> How many have you pulled in? Hundreds? Uh, what? A bunch of A bunch of big ones. What's your biggest now? Like 13 something? 13.8. 13.8. He pulls them in the boat. I'd be in the airboat going the other way. <laughs> I'd be the first one to say I'm, I'm not that. You you're a much braver man. I, 
could not do it. But um, yeah, you'll notice when the game are active, uh, when the fish are active, the, the animals are active. And make mental notes, rim notes. Um, when if you go back to the same set of oyster bar or, or mangroves, and you want to fish that same spot on the same tide, two weeks to the day it'll be the same tide. Two weeks later, if you had a great trip Monday. The 14th, well, exactly two weeks later, you'll have that same tide in that same spot. Almost identical. It's every two weeks. Something to remember. Hey, I had a great night Monday night. Well, two weeks from now, two weeks from that night, it's going to be that same tide, same spot. Uh, many times I take guide trips out, and I call them spot safaris sometimes. Because they, they, they all but bring out the handheld GPS now. Now they got their phone and record the whole thing, but whatever. You know, if you need a handheld GPS to go find my spots again, you shouldn't be on the water. It's so easy. But a lot of, oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times I've gone back to go fish a spot, and there's the boat, and I look over at the boat, and there's John and Bill from the night before, and they've been sitting there for four and a half hours, and they're like, hey, Dave! And I'm like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, that's a nice boat you didn't have. <laughs> but, uh, hey, how you doing? You getting them? We haven't got a thing. Uh, they, they were there three hours too soon, and they spooked them. I don't want to fish a spot that's already been fished, and the best the best way I can describe that is you don't want to hunt for bird in a field two other hunters have walked through ten minutes earlier. You've got to find fish that are undisturbed, laid up in a feeding station, what I call feeding station or drive-through. They lay up in these feeding stations and wait for the bait to be come to them. There's very few baits that want to buck the tide, that want to fight the tide and go into the tide. Shrimp don't do it. Shrimp flow with the tide. You try to pull a shrimp against the tide, and it just ends up looking like super shrimp. And the snook don't want it. You've got to let that shrimp flow with the tide. Let a pinfish flow with the tide. Let a grunt flow with the tide. But if you put a mullet on there, yeah, he'll buck the tide. He'll go against the tide. A needlefish will fight the tide. A ladyfish will run against the tide and run away from the snook. Um, a mahara has got the strength to run against the tide. The sandfish will run against the tide. But... When I'm jig fishing, you can sometimes jig fish against the tide, but slow it way down. I tend to want to work my jigs with the, you know, flow with the tide. If I'm beach fishing or pass fishing, throw the jigs out, let them go to the bottom, let them bounce out with the tide. Wait for that hit, thump them. Circle hooks are fantastic. You just reel. Um, once you get the snook near the boat, you know, a lot of times I see this. This is one of my favorite things. You know, a snook this long. Okay, you got about a 25-inch snook, and I see them bring the snook alongside the boat. They throw them in the net, and then they, they got them in the net, and they bring them over the side of the boat and go like this. I mean, just boom, crash, whoop, boom, right down the deck. Oh, there goes the slime, the stress coat. There goes the scales, which protects them from infection. My favorite is when they haul them up on the bridge, swing them over the rail, slam them down the concrete, and then they go out there and they step on them like this and take their pliers and unhook those, uh, you know, whatever they uh, got you or something they got them on. You know why they call them gotcha, right? Because when they come loose, they come back and they gotcha because it's like a lead weight. Um, they're horrible. And then they, they, they go like this, and then they're holding them for a picture on a lip gripper like this, dislocating their jaw and messing them all up. I did it myself for years before I knew about it. And they, they're out there, and they hold them like this for a picture over the 